And that state, we're not seeking or avoiding. We're not letting the extrinsic world run us. We're centered, we're poised, we're present, we're purposeful. Living with a governed, self-governance type of state of mind versus letting yourself get irrationally unstable with wild, impulsive, and instinctual emotions. And what makes the difference? So I'm going to um, elaborate on that. In the Breakthrough Experience program that I've been teaching now for over 30, almost two years, I make a distinction, primarily from the extracted readings from Emmanuel Kant, who's the German philosopher, of a transcendent state of mind and a imminent state of mind. <clears throat> a transcendent, transcendent state of mind is when you have transcended the outer uh, emotional reactions. And the imminent state of mind is when you are, you might say, succumbing to them. You're letting the world around you run you extrinsically versus the transcendental is where you're letting yourself be guided from within with governance, more intrinsically driven. I said in the secret movie many years ago that when the voice and vision on the inside is louder than all opinions on the outside, you begin to master your life. That means that you're intrinsically driven and focused instead of externally reactive. Now, you're not going to completely rid yourself of those outside reactions because they're essential, they're feedback systems. I know there's a second you know something, you go on to the next unknown. And when you know something, um, you, you transcend it and you go on to something you don't know. And there's an, uh, an infinitude to that. No matter what you know, there's always something more. And whatever you've achieved, there's always something you can do more of. So there's an infinitude to that, an infinite quest. Now, let me define an emotion, first of all, <clears throat> an instability. An emotion is an attraction or repulsion a seeking or avoiding um, an impulse or an instinct toward or away from something that you perceive to provide you in the future more positives and negatives or more negatives and positives. Let me uh, elaborate on that. Um, when you are faced with an experience, an event, you will probably <clears throat> evaluate it which means to project your values, your values onto it. And if you perceive whatever is going on as more supportive than challenging to yourself, you'll probably activate your parasympathetic nervous system. You'll activate acetylation in your epigenetics and you'll create physiological and psychological motor responses to seek it out, to engulf it because you'll associate it uh, as supportive and prey-like, and you'll tend to want to consume it and take it in. And you'll have an impulse towards it. And in some cases, if the ratios of your perception are extremely high and supportive nature, you'll be addicted to it, literally driven to it, compulsively, impulsively, where you can't even stop. You've got to have it. You you're get so subjectively biased towards it, you just can't be without it. At the same time, you could also perceive things more challenging than supportive, more negative than positive, and you uh, could have the opposite response, an instinctual response to avoid it and to get away from it, and repel from it. And you can get that to extreme where you've got to get away from it. I think almost everyone here has had one of those uh, incredible infatuations or incredible resentments to something or somebody. Now, this state leaves you with a blood glucose and oxygen response into your amygdala, which is a desire center, which is a subcortical area of the brain. A lower, I uh, won't say more primitive because other species below us have it, <clears throat> but, uh, and they also have an advanced part of the brain, but it's less um, mastered, let's put it that way, and more extrinsically driven. And it's there for uh, emergencies. It's there for thrive as a survival, not thrival. And so we need that when we are under the perception. If we perceive something extremely positive or negative, we're going to activate that area of the brain as a response, as a survival response. That's not bad, it's there for us. If a car's about to run us over, it gets us out of the way. <clears throat> if a lion's about to chase us and eat us, it makes us uh, 
run it, climb a tree in a, in a way we didn't know we could do. But um, <clears throat> this is the extrinsically emotional center. Emotions are, again, motive towards or away. And they are sensory based. I mean, some sort of perception is imbalanced because you have an imbalanced perspective. When you're infatuated with something, you're conscious of the upsides, unconscious of the downsides, conscious of the positives, unconscious of the negatives. You have a confirmation bias on the positives, a disconfirmation bias on the negatives. You have a false positive on the positives and a false negative on the negatives in the language. And you have <clears throat> a desire to seek it in your desire center. And when you do, you are not seeing both sides of it. You're ignorant and unconscious of the downsides. So you really don't know it. Just like you've been infatuated with somebody, you really don't know them yet. You're just blinded to the downsides and drawn to them and they're running it. And you have, in a sense, an uncertainty uh, because you don't really know all the parts. And your intuition is trying to whisper the downsides, but you're ignoring it because of the high polarity of perception and um, the fantasy that you can concoct. And you activate dopamine and oxytocin. Dopamine is sort of like the addicting compound. Uh, oxytocin and vasopressin are like the bonding and, and trust compounds. Uh, endorphins and encephalons are like the pleasure compounds. And serotonin and, and estrogen are like the nurturing, well, it's like the fantasy and nurturing compounds. And so you create this fantasy and you look into the future and you see more positive and negatives and you've got to have it. And it's prey, you wanna eat it. Just like you're infatuated, you almost wanna consume them. And consumption, uh, shopping is part of that. You have this fantasy that it's gonna give you more advantage and disadvantage. Anytime you perceive more advantage and disadvantage, you wake up the impulsive part that's attracted. Now, in fact, you've looked back at your life and you've been infatuated with people, and but days, weeks, or months, you start to wane on that. <clears throat> you start to see both sides of them. You, you start a little bit of withdrawal from them. They're less attractive and you end up grounding yourself and getting yourself back into a balance. And uh, you have a hedonic adaptation, which is an adaptation to things you're hedonistically pursuing like that, that calms it down and calms down your emotions over time and strengthens your intuition because your intuition is always trying to reveal to you the parts you're unconscious of. So you have a balanced orientation to liberate yourself from the attachment because anything that you infatuate with will occupy space and time in your mind and run you. And if you, we've all been infatuated, incredibly infatuated, you could hardly sleep at night because you're just running around and regurgitating this idea and fantasy in your mind that you're attracted to. When you're resentful, the same thing in reverse occurs on the opposite pole. And it is a pole, uh, like a magnetic pole. You're now perceiving consciously the upside, the downsides and unconscious of the upsides. You have a confirmation bias on the downs. You have a and disconfirmation bias on the ups. You have a false positive on the negatives and a false negative on the positives. And you're subjectively biased away from it with an instinct to avoid. And now you've got to get away from them and you're ignorant of the upsides. And so there or it is running you and you go to sleep at night. You can't get it out of your mind because you're so resentful, you could hardly sleep. So that means you have instability because of an imbalanced perspective. So I want the first principle to be understood that anytime you have a ratio of perceptions that are imbalanced, where more positives or more negatives are dominating and the more negatives or more positives are recessive, the second you have an imbalanced irrational state, a ratio of one to one is rational. A ratio of seven to one or one to seven, positive to negative are irrational and they're emotional and emotions are a result uh, of these misperceptions, these biases, which are called subjective biases. And they are feedback -like mechanisms to let you know that you don't see things as they actually are. You see things as you hallucinate from previous experience stored in your subconscious mind that's added to the, the actual perception, the receptions, and integrating into perceptions that are skewed subjectively and they're letting you know that you're not seeing the whole, you're seeing the parts that are fragmented and irrational and incomplete. And therefore you result inside you with an uncertainty and a defense mechanism to justify your bias. So anytime you see something and you confront somebody that's highly biased, you'll see that they defend themselves. And the defense is a result of their uncertainty. And anytime you have an imbalanced ratio of perceptions, you have uncertainty, instability. <clears throat> volatility, 
Now, <clears throat> you probably heard of the term, the facial muscles of emotional expression or the muscles of uh, emotional expression, facial expression. And, um, you know, happy and sorrow and you know, disgust and these kind of things. And many scientists or psychologists have tried to say that there's only six or eight emotions. And that's ludicrous. I'm, I'm amazed that they've tried to narrow it down to just a few. You have a, every ratio of perception has a different emotion. Every ratio of perception has a different emotion. And you can be compounding your perceptions at any moment and have an assortment of overlapping emotions. So all the variations of secondary emotions that the psychologists have tried to categorize these things, which are partly ludicrous and, and arbitrary, and they've never had exact science out of it because it's very biased. What happens is all of those emotions are nothing more than the compounding of overlapping ratios of perceptions in that moment and the associations that are being brought to the receptive uh, input all by the subconscious mind that's coming in and associating all previous experiences with these perceptions. And those overall ratios are giving you the response. And those responses will cause, um, first, from the summation into the brain, you'll create a neuroassociative complex in the brain, that's what they call it. That will cause facilitation and inhibition of various parts of the brain, which are through associative areas from previous subconsciously stored information will then cause the motor response in the front part of the brain to be activated to create an emotional reaction, a response, a stimulus response response based on all the subconsciously stored information. So that means you could have a, a stimulus. Let's say you met somebody that uh, you, didn't, uh, you didn't have a greatest experience with. It's quite painful in your mind. And now somebody comes along and reminds you of any aspect of them their facial expressions, their mannerisms, their, what they were dressed like, or anything that's associated with it, it could trigger a distrust. Uh, it could trigger uh, a, an emotional response of avoidance. Not, not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel this is great vibes. And you'll come up with those things from the previous subconsciously stored information. And anything that you have imbalanced in your perception that you've got conscious and unconscious splits will be stored in the subconscious mind which will be left in electronics and molecular imbalances in neurochemistry and be stored in there, reverberating in circuits in the brain that cause all this noise in the brain. When you're in meditation, you'll know that your brain has got all this noise when it starts. And all that noise is nothing but the subconsciously stored imbalanced perceptions that you have that are now being uh, associated with all the newest input that's coming in at that moment, unless you close your eyes, close your senses off. And it's uh, causing these reverberations in the brain, all this noise. And sometimes in meditation, it takes 15, 20 minutes for some people to calm that down and override that and go into a metacognitive state and uh, transcend that. But that's where most people live and most people are associated with it. That's one of the reasons I created the Demartini method that I present in the Breakthrough Experience to assist people in sorting through, like a disc scan, sorting through all those cognitive fragments those imbalanced perceptions that lead to uncertainties and unclarities and cloudiness of mind and uncertainty about your mission in life and, and sort through it and ask quality questions that hold you accountable to bring your mind back into balance to have a rational mind. And the moment you do, you enter into a secondary state called the transcendent mind. The transcendent mind is only awakened, and I say only awakened, and most people don't even know it exists and don't even know how to access it when you have a perfectly balanced mind. So as long as you have a irrational mind, an unstable mind, an uncertain mind, and you're vacillating with the vicissitudes of these polarities, uh, you don't have the transcendent mind. The transcendent mind only comes awakened when you have a perfectly balanced mind. And the positives and negatives, the supportive and challenging, the polarities are synchronously synthesized. As the dialectic by Zeno and Hegel talked about taking a thesis, an antithesis, a proposition, and an antiproposition, and merging together at the same moment. Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli talked about it in their work on a causal synchronicities, where you actually have a synthesis and synchronicity of these complementary opposite perceptions, and the ratios are brought back into equanimity, a perfectly balanced, objective mind. The transcendental mind is awakened. Now, Manuel Kant said that there's no way we can live in there. We live with our subjective biases most of the time. Most neuroscientists don't believe we can ever get past the subjective experiences. 
But I found a way of doing that. I teach it in the breakthrough experience and I give it to you in the Demartini method. There is now a science reproducible, duplicatable way of accessing it. But it's a cognitive science. And I made it a cognitive science because I want it to be reproducible, duplicatable that any human being can do. And uh, it's not that difficult. Little children do it and adults do it and elderly people do it. So age is not a factor. It's simply our tendency to want to hold on to our opinion of being right that makes it difficult. And that's what blocks us because being right is automatically going into a pride and trying to avoid a shame mechanism. That's why we show off our face when we're proud and we hide our face when we're shamed. And that is our animal nature. And our animal nature interferes with this transcendent state. Uh, it's... Uh, this metacognitive state is available only if we can transcend these ratios of perceptions. And so the quality of our life is based on the quality of the questions we ask. And our job is to bring self-governance to our state where we can see things as they are. The actuality, self-actualization as Maslow would describe. And the moment we see things from a balanced perspective and allow our intuition to be strengthened, which our intuition is constantly trying to reveal the unconscious to make us fully conscious. It's trying to take the ignorant part and make it wise and make us fully aware. So we're not having this bias and we're not seeing false uh, positives and negatives. We're seeing both sides. We don't have survival. We have thrival. We're not in the desire center, the amygdala. We're now in the executive function of the prefrontal cortex, the telencephalon. Uh, the telencephalon is the end in the brain, just like the telos is the end in mind. And it's where we activate the most amazing parts of our mind. This is where inspired states occur. This is when true love, not infatuation occur. This is where grace or true gratitude, not false gratitude. Oh, thank you for supporting me. This is where we are enthused, where we have the God within, if you will, the divine experience that's transcendent within. This is where we transcend mediocrity and go on to extraordinary. This is where innovation occurs, creative in, in thinking there. Unborrowed vision occurs. This is where we're inspired. This is where we actually have the most certainty and the most presence. Only in a perfectly equilibrated mind can we have certainty. Otherwise, we have un uncertainty and volatilities. I've demonstrated this in 100,000 people over the years, and I'm certain about the state. We can, we can access it. And it's all based on the quality of the questions we ask. Our, our, our questions in life are make us aware of things we're ignorant of. If I ask you, what's the benefit of something happening, and you don't see the benefit, if I hold you accountable to answer that question and look for the benefit, you will discover it. Because there is no one-sided event that's no benefits. There's always a benefit to whatever. You can extract the benefit out of anything. It's just about how you ask the question. If you ask the question and answer the question, you can see both sides of things. And the moment they equilibrate, then they're perfectly balanced at the same moment. And you're aware of both the positive, negatives, the supportive and challenging, the, the, the kind and the cruel, the nice, the mean, the, whatever the polarities are. Um, the synthesis and synchronicity of any complementary opposite awakens the transcendental mind. And the transcendental mind, which is the area of the prefrontal cortex activation, this is the governor. This is the one that actually sends signals down to the nucleus accumens and the pallidum of the, the amygdala and calm down the extrinsic uh, stimuli and neutralize it with facilitatory um, glutamate and, and uh, GABA inhibitor transmitters and it calms it down and allows you not to be in survival, but to be in thrival. And living an inspired, focused, enthused, grateful, loving, certain and present life, which I call the transcendental feelings, are not emotions. Emotions are polarized and the transcendental feelings are synthesized. They're both mental states. One's a lower mental state, as William James said, one's a higher mental state, or one's called the uh, the amygdala and the other one's the prefrontal cortical area, or one's called the reflexive mind, which is like an animal, and the other one is a reflective conscious mind, a super conscious mind, and the subconscious. The imminent mind is the subconscious state where we store all of our emotions and all of our conscious and unconscious splits and our polarities, which run most people. And then there's the transcendent mind where we actually have the capacity to synthesize and store in our super conscious mind, sometimes called our soul, the state of unconditional love, we store those moments of grace that we have that allow us to do extraordinary things, super mundane things. And this is where the genius is awakened. When we, when we live, and it correlates with our values, our values, when we live by our highest value, we, we have a higher objectivity, we have more neutrality, we're more resilient, adaptable, we're more balanced in our orientation, 
more reasonable in our focus, have the logos and a sense of our awareness, and we now awaken our magnificence instead of our insignificance. Because as long as we're run from the external world and we're infatuated with info and they're occupying space and time and mind, we're an automaton reacting to misperceptions that are biased and subjective and holding us in a bondage to what we are infatuated with info to. We're living in bondage. We don't have moksha, liberation, satori, uh, illumination and, and enlightenment until we actually balance out our perceptions and liberate ourselves. That's why the Buddha says, the desire for that which is unavailable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable the pleasures, the pains, the impulse, the instincts, the animal desires from, from below, the, sub, the subcortical areas are interfering in a sense, and yet they're acting as feedback mechanisms to let us know what we haven't loved. So they're interfering in the sense of the fullest expression, but they're guiding us to that fullest expression if they're interpreted properly and wisely. So that's why I put the Demartini method together. I put it together to ask questions to help you transcend that. Now, the second you transcend it and you go on to the transcendent state and you're inspired and you're now inspired to get up and take action, do something to, you might say, awaken your legacy, your more legacy in life and go do something extraordinary. You're going to be confronted by your next unknown, the next mystery, because you made history of the last mystery going on to the next mystery. In the Flammarion diagram, you're opening up the veil of the infinitude of the universe beyond, and you're going into the unknowns that nobody has knowledge of all things. There's always the knowing and the, the unknown beyond it. And that unknown tends to put us into back into our judgments, back into our imminent mind, back into our seeking and avoiding, back into our moral hypocrisies. And we get trapped again temporarily until we ask the quality questions again. Again, the Demartini method is brought back to the surface to ask new questions, to penetrate the next mystery, to break through the next boundary, to liberate ourselves again to uh, the things we are doing, to have our, our own will, you might say, match the real actualized universe, because the laws of the universe are, are not uh, biased by human invention. They are basically there as laws of the universe. And uh, we, at the moment we align with those laws of the universe, you might say matching human will with, some people have called it the divine order, divine will, if you will, we're liberated again, and we don't have the paradox of the predestination and free will. We don't have the paradox of necessity and contingency or determinism and indeterminism as the philosophers have been trapped in for centuries. We are now free in the transcendental state to see and get a glimpse of what is called the magnificent. And we're no longer trapped in the insignificance. So I'm a firm believer that if the quality of our life is based on those questions, and I put for since I was 18 years old, I'm 66 almost now in a few weeks, so I've been working on those questions in the Demartini method to help people liberate themselves from those emotional biases so they can see objective self-actualizing states. And uh, it's liberating and it's invigorating and it's vitalizing and it's inspiring to really see what actually is. As a man, uh, David Bohm says very beautifully that there's a hidden order, an implicate order inside the apparent chaos. And we know that the border of order and chaos is where maximum growth occurs. So when we can see this, the support and the challenge, the positives and negatives and all other polarities that we could ever perceive at the same time, we access this transcendental state. And that state, we're not seeking or avoiding. We're not letting the extrinsic world run us. We're centered, we're poised, we're present, we're purposeful. We're in a state of productivity and we're in priority at that moment because we're living by highest priority and we're living objectively. And this is a state of consciousness that we have access to. Can we stay there 24 hours a day? No, I don't want to mislead that. But can you experience that and go back to it anytime you've been perturbed and unstabilized by misperceptions of the external world? Yes. And can you transcend subconscious baggage that normally runs your life and weighs you down gravitationally with entropy and bipolar bits, you might say, of entropy? And... Uh, or can you transcend it and synthesize it and have an in quantum entangled state synchronously at the same time and transcend it and see things as they are for a moment and get a glimpse of the magnificence there. Leibniz called it divine perfection because he didn't know what else to call it because he realized that even though reductionistic science has a belief system that it's going to figure out the subjective experiences of the brain, the mystery box is still there. We still, even though we've reduced it now down all the way down to the DNA of the cells, we reduced it further and further and we enter into a quantum entangled world in the future. We're gonna end up and realize that the quantum entangled field 
is that panpsychic intelligence that's always been there that some people have called the divine. And I'm a firm believer that that's uh, accessible the second you ask the right questions. And so I'm not interested in going through the superficial ritual of a, of a spiritual nature. I'm interested in making a cognitive science turn into a spiritual experience because I really believe that true science and true philosophical religious constructs do not need to argue. They can be completely reproduced and integrated together and I'm interested in that. That's why I put together the Demartini Method. That's why I teach the Breakthrough Experience. That's really what the whole purpose of all my programs are. Even these little webinars that we do, as a, at least as a to whet people's appetite of what's the potential they have inside them. And this is what I love doing. I love watching people's lives transform when they get a glimpse of this magnificence. And so that keeps me fueled daily. So the reason for this class today is to let you know that you can live in the vicissitudes and the perturbations of the external world and the volatilities and end up bipolar and unstable and uncertain and have cloudiness. And then because of that brain offload all your decisions onto the cognitive uh, collective and become part of the herd and part of the sheep instead of the shepherd. Or you can actually be, you might say, the one who accesses the, the direct awareness the self-actualizing direct awareness that's available to people who know how to ask the right question and access an unborrowed visionary state and become not a collective herd individual, but actually a leader. And I believe that inside you, you wanna make a difference and you're only gonna make a difference to the degree of your uniqueness. And you have a unique set of values. If you live in priority and you delegate lower priority things and wake in your objective state, you can access the transmental mind magnificently at will. And that's what I, I, I love teaching people to do. I love, I'd love to teach you that process. I'm, that's why I do the Demartini Method. I was working on that this morning and writing an article on that this morning because uh, it, it gives us the options in life, the freedom in life to not let the world on the outside dictate our destiny, but to let the voice and the vision on the inside be more profound than all that on the outside. So you can live by the vicissitudes, again, the perturbations of the world around you. You can live in the instabilities of the emotional complexes, the superior complex of pride, the inferior complex of shame, the infatuations and resentments. Because when you infatuate, you're going to minimize yourself into shame. When you resent somebody, you're going to exaggerate yourself into pride. And you can get trapped in that, or you can transcend it and synthesize it. For centuries, the, the, the dialectic was for that objective, but it didn't have the ability to synthesize we now have taken the dialectic to the next level. I figured out a way of getting past the dialectic limitations and go what Hegel attempted to do to create a synthesized spiritual awareness. We now have a way of doing it. Even though Immanuel Kant didn't believe it was possible, there is now a way of doing it. And it, was, it came from the, a discovery in studying cell physiology, how I came up with it. But it's basically the synthesis and synchronicity of opposites. I call it the great discovery and it's in the Demartini method. And it's a great, the greatest discovery I've made in my studies of 40, almost eight years. And that is the realization that at any one moment, you don't perceive things that you polarize, they create these emotions without the opposite being there. You have to perceive contrast and these pairs of opposites can be seen simultaneously if you ask the right question and liberate yourself from those ratios of emotion that can distract you from being present. So if you want to be more present, you want to be more inspired, you want to be more grateful, you want to be enthused about your life, you want to be, in a sense, uh, loving your life and doing what you love and prioritizing things and delegating lower priority things and serving people and having something meaningful in your life, you have the capacity with the Demartini Method to help do that. And it will awaken an ever-expanding vision and you will eventually realize that you're a celestial being having a terrestrial experience, as some have said instead of a terrestrial being gravitationally drawn down to the planet, living small, narrow-minded, black and white, polarized, emotional, herd, you have the capacity to have a transcendental state and a celestial perspective. So I just wanted to share that with you in case that was uh, a little mouthful this morning. But, um, and I also wanna share a thing, how important it is that if you're not developing yourself, you see every time you polarize yourself, you're in personas. And if you're not developing and integrating personas in a personal development, which means to integrate those and mastering the art of transcendence, um, you're probably not reaching your fullest potential. So I'm a firm believer in that, or I wouldn't be doing this every single day of my life. I'm a firm believer that uh, you can transcend that. And that's why personal development is so important. The people that do it the most need it the least. The people that do it the least need it the most as far as achievements in life. 
So I'm very encouraging you to take advantage of that knowledge and um, take advantage of the breaks experience, take advantage of learning the method. It's, uh, it's profound and um, it's getting more profound as I keep polishing it over the years. And I also wanna share one last thing. I wanna share a gift with you. And that is activating your astronomical vision. And this is a, a presentation I did in a, uh, what do you call it, a, a planetarium to a group of executive individuals. And I, I want you to have this. I want you to take advantage of it. It's a journey of profound purpose, insight, and inspiration, as it says. You can get it by going on demartini.fm slash gift. And um, please take advantage of this. Get this, this uh, awakening your astronomical vision. It's about seeing yourself from a, a celestial perspective, not a terrestrial perspective. It's about living congruently where you expand yourself, not live in shrunk, you know? And um, it, it, it is, if you wanna make a difference in yourself, you need a vision bigger than yourself. And this is how to access a greater vision. This is how to be more objective. This is how to have self-governance. This is about how to transcend the, the external worlds that are stored in your subconscious mind that weigh you down and give you on the baggage. So if you want to transcend your baggage and, and leave it a baggage claim and get on a fly and, and fly across the world, not worrying about your baggage, um, then it's a metaphor. Then come to the, and get that, that, that little experience, activating your, or awakening your astronomical vision. I'm absolutely certain that what's in there, you'll watch it or you'll listen to it, pardon me, uh, probably six or 10 times. I, I know people that call me and they said, you know, I, I can't put this thing down. I listen to it. I listen to it again and again. There's so much in it. It's enriched and um, it's content rich. So take advantage of the gift and um, give yourself permission to do something extraordinary. Maybe listen to this again, this, this little presentation again, because you can transcend those instabilities with a stable, focused, and inspired mind. The transcendental state is available to you. So I look forward to seeing you on the next uh, little gathering we have next week. Thank you, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening there. Love you. Go for it. Give yourself permission to do something extraordinary. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining me.